Just while the keys are playing, I want to read a passage of Scripture with you. If you could turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. Isaiah, chapter 6. And we're going to read the first five verses. Last week, we started a series on worship, and we were reading from a different passage of Scripture, how someone else saw this picture of heaven and what it looks like. And we're talking about worship. What is worship? It is not the songs you sing, but yet the music is important because God created the instruments. We talked last week the fact that even the enemy, the devil, had, and I might read some scripture uh, the next time I preach, how his body was, was created with whistles and horns and all these kinds of things. He was an instrument. Whenever he spoke, he was making music. There's something inherent in music that is a, a significant part of worship, but it's not just the music. But you notice it sets the tone. Immediately a spirit is at rest. While you're turning there, Isaiah, 6, chapter, Isaiah chapter 6, reading verse 1 to 5. They once did a test about music. And they, they brought in some musicians. They were, they were a rock band to come and, and just sing a song to some mental patients. And I can't quote where this came from. Remember, it was, uh, 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 it was a story that I read. But I believe it's, it's based on truth. And so they brought this band in and they played. And the mental patients were very disturbed, like all upset. And so they thought, well, we can conclude, I suppose, that rock music stirs people up. So they brought in a classical music, right? And they came in and they played. And they were very peaceful. The mental patient thought, oh, okay, all right, that's interesting. So maybe rock music, bad, classical music, good. Then they decided, we'll do it one more time. They brought another rock band, in, and they played, and the people were at peace. Do you know the difference? They found out that that rock band were Christians, and they were worshiping through the instruments, worshiping through the songs. There's something powerful in worship. Let's read together Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe, that means his garment, the length of his garment, filled the temple. Above him was seraphs, each with six wings. With two of those six wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. What a powerful passage of Scripture. Thank you so much, kids, for taking the cue. You're dismissed for Kids Church. And thank you so much, Katie, for playing behind me. This is an incredible illustration of what happens when you encounter the presence of God. See, at the moment, you can't see him with your physical eyes. You can't hear him with your physical ears. But you can sense him with your spirit when you're actively seeking him. The Bible says when you worship him in spirit and truth, that's what a true worshiper is. When you're acknowledging him in spirit, this is what we're saying, if you try and worship him with soul, it will only go so far. It will be based on the cleverness of the, key, the person playing the instruments. It will be based on the cleverness of the guys doing the sound and lighting to make sure it's just right. The skill of the people is what you're relying on. But when it's spirit, your spirit is able to see into the spirit realm. The Bible tells us that your spirit communicates with the Holy Spirit directly. 
And so you're in communion with the Spirit, and all of a sudden you are translated into the heavenly realms as you are worshiping with angels, as you are worshiping with the saints that have gone before us. Worship, when you see the King of kings and the Lord of lords, it is powerful. I was reading through and I was reminded, I was thinking of the Beatles concert, but I came across this particular account of a Michael Jackson concert. The concerts of Michael Jackson, I mean, the Beatles are amazing, let me tell you. The, the, the fans were swooning, the girls, and people had never seen a phen- phenomenon like this. They were swooning for Elvis Presley as well, I must admit. But the Beatles, when they came out, they were huge, and people never saw anything like this before. But Michael Jackson took it to a whole new level. One of the greatest concerts that he ever played had 500,000 people. Just think about that for a moment. When you see a a, a vast sea of 5,000 faces, we see that at carols, right? That's big. And you're lost. I mean, past that point, we really don't know anymore. But 500,000 people is what they were saying approximately were there. And in that time, listen to this. Michael Jackson, uh, he, he, he put a new upper limit on what concerts are like. This, in his 1992 concert in Bucharest, the concert site could only accommodate 70,000 people, but they squeezed in 72,000 people. The venue was surrounded by a crowd of people. That's how they were able to have that many more people. Many fans could not enter and could only watch outside the venue. And so that audience reached 500,000. And so the Romanian government sent troops to maintain order. And the organizer also organized a medical team of 2,000 people on standby. According to a rough estimate, during the concert, about 5,000 people fainted on the spot. On the average, 10 fans fainted due to excitement in less than a minute. Among them... 23 people were too excited and lost control of their emotions, leading to myocardial infarctions, or they were stomped and they died directly in a concert. I want to tell you that their response to Michael is not simply that they were engaged or that they were entertained. It was more than that, much more than that. People were fainting, overwhelmed by emotions that they couldn't control anymore. They felt they were feeling these emotions by someone who could never help them. They were feeling these emotions by someone who would never sit with them, who would never love them, who would never encourage them, who would never notice them in a crowd, let alone recognize them. Imagine Michael Jackson saying, hey, Brad, how you doing, bud? Good to see you again. That would never happen. There was nothing that they could receive from Michael Jackson except to be entertained. Yet their extreme response for him is telling you they were worshiping Michael Jackson. Do we really understand what it is to worship God? Think about your worship this morning. All heaven was watching you. The Bible says a crowd of great witnesses are watching you. All of heaven is watching you in this moment. Let me tell you, if you want to understand how I worship, I'm playing to the best of my ability. I'm not great. And I'm praying that someone better will come along and take over. JJ's really great. I'm so glad to have him this morning. Why don't we appreciate JJ on the drums this morning? He plays every instrument. But I'm praying that we get more guys to replace me who are better than me. Why? It isn't about doing the best thing that we want to have a concert sounding quality. It's not about that. The reason we do this is because we want to offer our very best. When I worship the Lord, I'm on that microphone and I'm singing. I don't know what you're thinking of me when I sing. I don't care, actually. I am singing as if it's the last time I will ever sing on this planet. Every single time I sing and I'm up here, I see it as if, what if this is the last time? What if the Lord were to take me out tomorrow or to take me out later today? I must worship him to the best of my ability. I must give him my very best. I can't offer him anything less than my very best. 
When we had lots of musicians and I was sitting there, you can, uh, uh, let me tell you, the, the worship leaders are very frustrated because there's Pastor Paul right in the front row leading <laughs> from the front row. I was seeing these songs of worship leaders looking, mm, you know, I'm supposed to go in there with that song. I don't care. I just want to worship the Lord. I just love him so much. The Bible says King David humiliated himself in worship as they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. His plan was to build a temple for the Lord. He was so excited about this that he stripped down to linen clothing, which a king would never do. And a king would never be prancing around, jumping and singing. His wife was so offended by his worship. Rick Warren, who leads a church of 23,500 people. I'm trying to, again, trying to get my head around that. Imagine leading a church of 23,500 people, gets approached by people all the time, and they'll tell him, Pastor Warren, I really enjoy the worship today. Expecting him to be flattered by the comment. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, he doesn't do that. How he responds is this. He says, that's good, but it wasn't for you. Jonathan Powers, who is an assistant professor at Asbury Theological Seminary, has this illustration. This is very powerful. He says, imagine you're celebrating a birthday party for your child. You, you buy a cake, you invite the guests, and you give her presents, right? Now, imagine discussing the party with your spouse later that night. Your spouse asks you what you thought of the party. You say, I don't know. I didn't really get anything out of it. It didn't impact me. It didn't feed me very well. People didn't bring me presents. We sang happy birthday with the guitar, but I'd rather hear it on an organ. Do you get the idea? We say these things about worship all the time because we make worship primarily about us rather than primarily about him. It's always been about him. Worship is not for you. It's for God. Let me ask you this morning. I want you to think about it. How was your heart engaged with worship this morning? We just preached about it last week, and you came today. How were you worshiping the Lord? If the way you sang was any indication, you didn't worship. I saw you. <laughs> the pastor's in the front watching you. If your exuberance and raising your hands and just getting lost with eyes closed was any indication, you weren't worshiping today. Those in, on uh, live stream can see this. Okay, you can't see what was happening right here. Why do you think we're preaching about worship? I really felt strongly in the spirit that if we don't get this, we as a church are not going to grow. If you can't connect with the creator of the universe, if you can't get him, if you can't appreciate what we have in this place, we won't go any bigger than this. It won't grow. Because something is unlocked. When you experience the greatness of God, becomes, you become great too. Because you become what you worship. Worship is not to acknowledge the awesome job of the talented worship and production team. It's a response to God. The job of the worship team is to make it easier for you to worship God. They themselves are told, worship God with everything you've got. Spare nothing. Spare nothing. Give everything to the Lord. This is saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. The job of the worship team, hopefully, is to make you thirsty for God. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to provoke you to love him, to become thirsty, because I can't make you drink. Perhaps the reason we don't worship God is because we have not truly encountered the living God. We don't know what we're supposed to do. We watch how other people worship, and so we think, oh, that's, that's how you worship. Some of you, you might have got saved in this church, and you've been watching how other people worship, and you think, oh, I guess that's how you worship.
Don't look at the person next to you. I was watching you. you tell them, I was watching you. <laughs> I remember watching Mr. Bean. You remember Mr. Bean back in the day? And it's this hilarious scene. I just, I remember just cackling. And they, uh, they had it at the haircutters where I get my hair done. It's this Mr. Bean videos. And it was the one where he's in church. You know the one? And he's, he's trying to follow the protocol. But clearly, he's a stranger to church. He hasn't been in church long enough to know anything at all. And so he's just watching the rest of them. Hallelujah. They're all standing up. And then, and then he stands up. And then he's still standing. And they're all seated down. And then he sits down again. You know, the whole show is like that. It's the funniest thing. And, he's, and remember the moment he's rolling as he's praying and his head hits the, the, the thing. And it's, it's the most hilarious thing. He has no idea what he's doing. We're a lot like that in church. We haven't been taught properly how to worship God. What, what is this all about? Can I say this to you? When you encounter God, I mean really encounter God, worship is an involuntary response to the awesomeness of God. Be very quiet this morning. Look at how Isaiah responds to the revelation of God seated on his throne before millions and millions and millions of people, all the saints that have gone before you, and the hosts and hosts and hosts of angels, thousands upon thousands upon thousands, worshiping. And he sees this picture, they're singing the song, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full. Full of his glory. I was reading this week how the Bible says that the earth is filled with his glory and people. This is the book of Romans chapter 1. And they're trying to deny the existence of God. He says, but it's all over the place. They have to lie to themselves to reject God. They have to find ways, evolution. I mean, my goodness, how can you get to that? And you say that you mock Christians for saying, how can Christians believe in science? No, how can you be an atheist and believe in science? Because what you believe doesn't make sense. The laws of science tell you can't get something out of nothing, and yet that's what revolution is. And where do we begin with this stuff? We don't seem to understand any of it. Isaiah, for the very first time in his life, he's been called by prophet of God. He's prophesied before. People knew the name of Isaiah. Among the Jewish people, he's called one of the major prophets, highly respected. But he had not yet seen who God is. And he writes about it in Isaiah chapter 6. For the first time in the, king, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Oh my goodness. To be able to see the Lord, to sense his presence for the first time. Look at the outcome of what happens after he sees this sign. He's seeing thousands and thousands of people. And then the angels in all their glory. And he's overcome with the glory. He's overcome with this vision. And this is what he says in verse 5. Woe to me. I cried, I am ruined. For us. Isaiah saying, I am ruined. If you have ever, ever truly experienced God, let me tell you, you will be ruined. I had to look up that word ruined. Oxford Dictionary defines it as having been irreparably damaged or harmed. In other words, you cannot repair it again. That's what ruin means. He's saying, God, I've seen you in your glory. I thought I had it all worked out. I'm a prophet of the living God, and now I am done for. I am undone. Have you ever tried to fix something that was broken? And you damaged it even worse? I remember when I was a kid, I used to love to tinker around, and I had one of these cars. You pull back. You let it go and it travels. Now, we didn't have a lot of money back in those days, so I really treasured this toy. I think it might have been a bat, I mean, a bat mobile. Let me tell you, they're hard to come by back in those days. No internet to order from China or anything like that. So when, I, when it was given to me by my dad, it meant everything to me. I played with the thing every day until I broke it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to fix it. So I got a screwdriver, opened the thing up, tried to fix the engine and totally stuffed it up. But I covered myself because I tried to put it back in. It's like, now I won't even move at all. So I'm like, what am I going to do? I can't pull it back. I can't push it forward. I'm going to pull the engine out. I had to repurpose the toy. 
So there's no longer a pullback toy, but I can use it for other things now. See, that's what it means to be ruined. You can't do the things that you were doing before again and continue. You are ruined. Everything now has to drastically change in your life. Everything about you changes. He, Isaiah, was utterly undone. However he lived his life before, he can never live it the same again. That's what happens when you encounter God. Why do you think we say in our little motto for Life City Church, experience Jesus? That's why we called it that. Because when you do experience him for the first time, you will be completely undone, broken, irreparable damage. You're now going to have to repurpose yourself a different, by the way, better than you were before. Better. The effect of encountering this awesome, awesome holiness of God, the righteousness of God. Like he had never seen anything like it. There's nothing on earth that can compare to what it is really like when you are in the presence of the living God, to really see him, to really experience him. I mean, how do you experience righteousness and not feel your unrighteousness? So Isaiah became painfully aware of his own sin. See, we're in worship here because you cannot see him unless you worship him in spirit. But if you try and worship him in soul, you're not going to experience him. You're going to be basing your entire worship on what we do here. That we're skillful enough to do it. And let me tell you, we'll fail. We will fail you. I'm sorry. We're not that good. Not good enough. We're going to get better. They're going to be amazing, guys. But are you going to wait for them to lead you into the presence of God? Don't you want to worship? See, we have a choice right now to worship him. And we can hide our sins from the person sitting right next to us. They don't know the sins and the thoughts and the intents of our heart. But God, who sees everything, knows everything about you, every detail. You can't hide your sin from God. He knows them. Every sin of commission where you did it, you committed an act. But every sin of omission, things you should have done, you didn't do it. He sees them all. He sees every thought that you have. You might not have spoken it out, and you were saved by that, but God saw the intents of your heart. He knows what you were thinking. And so Isaiah, he says, woe to me. I am ruined. And he goes on, he says, and exposing why? For, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. What did Isaiah mean by unclean lips? Unclean lips is a way of admitting the awful things that we utter day after day with our mouths. With our mouths we curse. Oh, that person is such a jerk. You just cursed them. That guy's such a loser. You cursed him. With our mouths, we lie. With our mouths, we abuse. With our mouths, we belittle. We boast. We use dirty words and profanities. We think it's okay. It's not okay. As a Christian, it's not okay. You are undone. If you were ruined in the presence of God, you will never use it again. You can't. Blast others with their mouth. They blaspheme the name of God like the other people you're working with. Jesus Christ. You think they'd be Christians. We're not for the extra stuff they say. With their mouths, they criticize. With their mouths, they talk about other people. With their mouths, they bring hateful speech. With their mouths, they flatter with no intention of actually meaning what they say. It's really a lie. With their mouths, they deceive the person. With their mouths, they provoke people. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, the second portion says, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I remember an old lady pastor had come to Indonesia. She was ordained by my father. And was sent all over Indonesia to, to preach the gospel. Elaine was her name. You might remember her. But she says, you know, Paul, it's in that moment when you smash your thumb with a hammer. 
<laughs> is that moment when the airline's about to crash, where you find out the true nature of people because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks blankety blank, blank, blank. Is that what was really in your heart? Or you scream out, Jesus, help me. Here's why worship is so powerful. Worship changes the words that come out of our mouths from something evil, because everything in our heart is evil, there's iniquity in our heart, to something good. Worship takes a language of men and changes it to the language of heaven so that when you're singing, when you are really worshiping in spirit and those words you are speaking, actually you're grabbing hold of saying, I'll take that, I'll own that. These are my words and I'm going to sing it to him. And all of a sudden what happens is in that moment you are translated to heaven and you are singing with the heavenly hosts. All creation is constantly singing this star song, this whale song, this music happening all around the universe, and we are incapable of capturing all those songs and all those sounds and all those melodies, but all of it is in a rhythm. There's a rhythm of life and is singing songs of glory to God as all the angels sing unto him. Perhaps the reason we fail to give God worship that is due to him is that it's been a long time since we've recognized his awesome presence. I use the word awesome all the time. It's a normalized word. And I'd say, oh, awesome. Yeah, good on you, awesome. But really, the word awesome only belongs to God. No one else can bring you such awe. Take anything great in this world, put him next to God on his throne, and you realize, oh, that's just, that's just nothing, nothing compared to who he is. You might be worshiping because you learned it by watching others, not really understanding what's happened. Listen to this. It is believed that the incantation, you know how the magicians of old would say, hocus pocus. Do you remember that? Hocus pocus was actually spoken right, to, to convey magical transformational powers. It's actually derived from hoc est enim corpus meum, the Latin phrase meaning, this is my body uttered by Roman Catholic priests during the Eucharist, the communion, the Lord's Supper, in the Mass. The, the congregation confused these as magical words because they didn't understand the Latin and believed that those magical words could transform the bread and wine into Jesus' actual body and blood. <laughs> so they're trying to repeat that. I need a really powerful phrase. Hocus pocus is actually part of a Latin worship. And that's what we're in danger of if we don't understand really what we're worshiping, how to worship. Because when you understand worship, it affects you inwardly and it affects you outwardly. John the Revelator, John wrote the book of Revelations. He revealed how the hosts of heaven were affected by this. So we read how Isaiah was affected. He's talking about himself. I am undone, I am ruined. But listen to what John the Revelator says. But while that's happening in the Isaiah, look at what's happening to the rest of heaven. Revelation chapter 4, verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him. We see a picture, not just the elders. It means everyone is worshiping the Lord. Whenever they sing, it says... Whenever they sing and give glory and honor and thanks to him, the 24 elders fall down. You may be wondering, well, how often do the seraphim worship God with a song? Revelation chapter 4, verse 8 tells us a story. Day and night, they never stop. There must be something about the awesomeness of God. Like one scene is not enough to capture. A photo, you know, they say a photo captures a thousand words. It wouldn't do that with God. Because he's constantly revealing more and more of his glory to those in heaven, and they are undone. The seraphs have to cover their faces and cover their feet because they would be blown apart if they don't do that. Their, their wings, for some reason, protect them because they're that close to God, that close to his glory. I remember trying to understand and picture what it looks like, and I was remembering this track when I was growing up in the 70s. 
Uh, one of the tracks was This Was Your Life. Did you guys ever read that? Anyone ever read that? This Was Your Life? You didn't? And in this picture, it's like a drive-in theater, this big screen. But you'll see towering over this big screen is this majestic, awesome God. He is huge. He is, he is like skyscraper big. And all the people around that throne, milling around watching that big screen, are tiny little things in comparison. It would make you feel small to stand in the presence of the living God. I think to myself, I am the be-all and end-all. God loves me. I'm his favorite. I'm it. But no, he, <laughs> you're his favorite too. I don't know how he does that. You're his favorite. Turn to the person next to you. Tell him, you're God's favorite. Turn to the other person, neighbor. God loves you so much. I think we forget that. So many people, millions and millions and millions of people, and he loves us all. But in our minds, we think, God loves me more than he loves Stephen. God loves me more than he loves Tracy. I don't believe that. <laughs> he, he, you're, his, you're his favorite. You know John the Apostle, who wrote the book of John? He wrote, the disciple whom Jesus loved, talking about himself. And he wrote it after all the other disciples had died. <laughs> he wrote it at the end of his life. The disciple of Jesus loved. No one was alive to actually argue. No, you weren't. We think we worked out who God is. But he's greater. Greater than anything you can possibly imagine or hope for. He is above every principality and power. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is present at all times, everywhere at the same time. I can't understand that. He knew that you were going to sin before you ever sinned. In fact, he knew every sin you were ever going to commit before you were born. In fact, he knew every sin every human being was ever going to commit. He knew the book of Genesis. He was going to write about how God grieved that he had made mankind. He saw it all and knew it before he created you. Before he created you, he already had appointed for Jesus to be sent down to this planet, not to just die for you, to die as you. Worship, right here, right now, is a voluntary response of the heart. When you can't see him right now, but your spirit knows he is real, it will change the way you worship. Worship is the acknowledgement of his rightful place in our lives. Katie, if you want to come up. Worship is an act of humility, right? You're stopping everything. You're saying, nothing, uh, nothing else I'm doing right now is more important than him. I will stop thinking about my lunch. I will stop thinking about the jobs that I have to do today, the jobs I have to do this week. I will stop thinking about the person sitting next to me. My entire thought, I will arrest it right now and only focus on him. That is an act of submission and humility to God. Worship is an acknowledgement that he is greater than you. Worship is an acknowledgement that we need him. He doesn't need us. Worship identifies us as children of God. That's what sets us apart. Worship allows God to move unrestricted in our lives. And remember, I'm not just talking about how you sing on a Sunday. I'm talking about Monday through Sunday. When you go to work, are you worshiping God at your work? What I mean is giving your absolute very best in your workplace, looking after people as if the company belongs to you and that your business depends on that person. You look after them well. Worship brings glory to God alone. And when we worship Him, we cease worshiping all other things. When we worship God, He becomes a central focus of our attention. And when we worship God, the supernatural and the natural realm become one once again.